Dr. Wondrous presented this lecture some time prior to the Snowflake Doctrine and Covenant Seminar. This recording contains much valuable information, and so we are pleased to be able to include it as an addition to the seminar recordings. It's the word calling him. Well, we, most of us understand what the word calling is. We've had a few of them in, in the church. And uh, it's, it's an appointment by divine authority to fulfill and carry out a particular office, function, or word. How do you like them? We're not talking about something this fall in the political area. The word elect is one who has uh, uh, previously been designated to a particular work. Uh, section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants designates Anna Smith as being an elect lady. And when uh, he was called to be the first Relief Society president of this dispensation, when the prophet, in a meeting of the Relief Society, got up and made reference to this statement by the Lord, that she was an elect lady, and said, Now her election has been fulfilled. Our election is is uh, uh, an appointment thing to a particular work or calling, and so in the sense then the words calling and election are, are synonymous. Uh, it's, a, it's a calling to do something and an appointment, and a person then becomes elect in the sense that, that uh, uh, they have been designated to carry out their particular function. But now there are two phases to the doctrine of calling and election. Uh, one is the doctrine of, of calling and election in the flesh. And the other, then, is the doctrine of the making of calling and election pure. Now, the first uh, began over here in the earth. Okay, this is where the doctrine of calling and election is first and it projects itself here uh, in mortality for its fulfillment. And then calling the Lord and pure begins here and projects itself to the resurrection. And so in order to understand the, the general doctrine, then we need to go back and say something about the, uh, the uh, previous things. Now, as things uh, got to the uh, point where we were prepared then in taking our final examinations, if I can put it that way, to come to this earth. Then the prophet Joseph taught that uh, there was a grand council held, and uh, he indicates uh, the new grand council, he calls it the grand council of the gods. And uh, uh, my wife is ran to, to get my to get my teachings. If I'm using the page on it, if you find, she's also got my notes. Uh, yeah, have you got that? Let me. Uh, on uh, page three forty eight and nine, the prophet is talking about the grand council. He says this: the head god calls together the god and sat in grand council to bring forth the world. The grand counselors sat at the head in yonder heavens and contemplated the creation of the world which was created at that time. And then he goes on to say, in the beginning, in the beginning, the head of the gods called the council of the gods, and they came together and to talk to the plans to create the world and the people of it. Now, this was a limited group of people. Uh, the uh, by God, and maybe we need a point of definition at this point on that particular subject. Uh, in Abraham chapter 3, beginning in verse 22, Abraham tells us about his vision of the pre earth life. And he says, Now the Lord has shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And he says, Among them there were many noble and great ones. And uh, he says, And God saw these souls, verse 23, that they were good. And he stood in the midst of them and said, These I will make my rulers, for he stood among those that were spirits, and he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them, thou wast chosen before thou wast born. And then Abraham makes an explanation. He says, And there stood one among them that was like unto God. Uh, apparently this is the pre-earth Christ, or Jehovah. 
And he said unto those who were with him, and those with him were his noble and great ones, he said unto those who were with him, We, not just me, we will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. And then Abraham describes briefly the conflict in the war in heaven, and uh, finally then as the action of creation begins, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said, Let us go down. Now who are the us? The noble and great with Christ. And they went down at the beginning, and they, that is the God, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. Uh, now, this earth then was created by uh, Christ alone. It was created by Christ as the executive of the Father, but uh, associated with him in the actions of creation were these noble and great ones whom the book of Abraham calls God. I mean, please. The pre-earth, we know for sure, for example, that Abraham was one of them, and I presume another great prophet of that time. Here in the teachings, for example, of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 375, uh, the prophet is talking about Moses as one whom the Lord, in the book of Exodus, designates as a god. Now, we have to understand what the term god means. It's, uh, there's a, a specific designation regarding the man of holiness and the Godhead, and now we've got to broaden it out a little bit. But the prophet after quoting some statements where the Lord uh, David his Moses is that, saying thou should be a God and the children of Israel, and the prophet Joseph makes this comment. He says, I believe those gods that God reveals his gods, and particularly now he's referring to, to Moses, uh, to be sons of God, sons of God who exalted themselves to be God even from before the foundation of the world. And they're the only gods that I have in reverence for. That's a kind of a pun on the prophet's side. Let me explain it this way. We talked about the new birth. Now, I don't know that all of you were here. We had more light than a couple of rows. But uh, in the new birth, uh, we take upon ourselves the name of Christ. Uh, the end result of the new birth, or at least the major result, is that we enter into a newness of life. Which newness is made uh, possible through the power of the Spirit, of the living power of truth and life and intelligence and revelation in our lives. And in the new birth, we literally partake of the Holy Spirit, which uh, conveys to us the powers and the attributes of deity. And so when we are born again, we become sons and daughters of God. And if you read the Pilgate Christ, the book of Moses, it makes a distinction between sons of men and sons of God. Uh, the sons of men were, were people who only got physical bodies, and they, they leveled off of that point and, uh, and uh, enjoyed themselves in that way. They were eating and drinking and marrying and all that kind of thing, and driving their street, and they their boats and so forth, and not worrying too much about building time. All right, now the sons of God, though, were those then who went through the processes of rebirth. Now, a person becomes a son of another being by receiving something from him. Uh, I become a son of my father in the flesh, who is my creator's brother, by receiving the physical attributes from him. And uh, when, we, when we become sons of God, then through Christ, we begin to partake of divine attributes and powers. And those are actual and literal powers of, of deity. And they change and they transform us. They make us new creatures. When we have them, then we'll do our home teaching. When we're just in the social order, we don't. When we have the newness of life in our soul, then we're alive to Christ and our are sensitive to our obligations. But now a person becomes a son by receiving. Now, if a person who then becomes such a person, a son, to receive, is then given keys of priesthood over a dispensation through which those divine powers are given to someone else, then what does he become? He becomes a father and a god. You see that? And in that sense, then, the noble and great ones in fear of life have exalted themselves to be gods even before the foundation of the world. 
And uh, the earth then was created, not just by Christ, but by him in connection with this body or group of noble and great ones. And uh, they were called gods. They are not beings to be worshipped, but they are beings to be revered. And among them probably were the great uh, uh, prophets of this age. Uh, the prophet Joseph would stand among them. Abraham, Eve. Uh, we have uh, testimony from the brethren that the day and said that he was among them. See. And so they, they're gods. Right, now they, there was a council then of the gods that was held. And in this council of the gods, then they planned the organization of the, of the earth. And uh, in that program, then uh, they not only planned the program, but it's here where the war in heaven had its basis. For example, in the teaching page 357, the prophet just makes a brief reference uh, to this point, and he says this, the contention in heaven was Jesus said there would be certain souls that would not be saved. And the devil said he could save them all, and laid his plans before the Grand Council. Now, he didn't lay them before everybody. He laid them before this august body of noble and great ones who were called gods, whom the head god, Elohim, called and brought forth. Uh, the devil laid his plans before the Grand Council, who gave their vote in favor of Jesus Christ. Uh, so this program, then, that leads to the doctrine of election in the place began at that great council. And uh, it's uh, this is not the council where we're all at. We get the idea at times that everything was wrapped up in one evening meeting and that we were all present. Now, that, that simply is not the case. Uh, if this is not consistent. It's not according to the procedures of priesthood. The procedures of priesthood are that uh, those who hold keys and authority then meet and under the revelation of the Lord, there's plans and programs made. And then those things are presented to the saints for their approval and their, any modification that might be made or anything like this. And so the initial council was a council uh, of the gods. There's some evidence the prophet Joseph Smith understood that this was held on full of it. All right, now after that, then there was a general conference of all spirits, and there we were all present. And uh, to hear the report of the Grand Council, and so we all met uh, Temple Square. And meantime, Lucifer, having bolted the initial council, was out passing out literature outside, <laughs> and beginning to raise the issues that he had, and apparently with more appeal than... than uh, uh, some would like him to have had. But uh, there was a general conference then of all of all spirits. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I don't know that I've got time to get into that, or even whether I should, to be honest with you. Uh, I haven't thought for the person on it, but uh, uh, we discussed it one time, President, a little bit when we talked about the temple. So I don't know that it's so secret it can't be talked about, but I would personally rather not get into it as, as of right now. Well, after the announcement was made, then the contention developed, and we had what we call the war in heaven. And uh, this with all of its conflicts and and struggle and strife and trauma, et cetera, uh, finally resulted then in Lucifer being cast out, and uh, uh, things went along then uh, in preparation for our earth life. Now, after uh, the war in heaven, then a third great council was held. And this is what I would call, and in some basic important teachings of prophets, uh, a grand organizational council. Let me give you a short three statements by the Prophet Joseph Smith on the subject. Page 158 to begin with. He says this, The Father called all spirits before him at the creation of man. Now this is when you get right down to ready to put man on earth. It was at that point. It wasn't before the war in heaven or during. It was at the creation. He says, He, Adam, is the head and was told to multiply. Now, here's where the doctrine of election comes in. 
Adam then is appointed to be the head. The head in what sense? That he's going to be the first man, and that he's going to hold the keys of holy priesthood over his posterity on this earth. And so there's an appointment, there's a designation that's made back here that is going to be fulfilled and realized over here. Uh, the teachings, page 181, uh, the prophet broadens this out a little bit, and uh, he says this, at the first organization in heaven, now that's not the first council, that's the first organization. Let me just pause a minute on that one. After the prophet's martyrdom, Apparently, he came back to, to Brigham Young and uh, with an important message. It's rather interesting that after Brigham Young died, he came back to Wilford Wood with the same message. And that passage is essentially this, teach the saints to get the Spirit of the Lord in their lives and to follow it. And as the prophet then gave that communication to Brigham Young, uh, then Brigham Young was shown how God had organized the human family for coming to earth. As Paul says, God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon all the first face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of our habitation. That's Acts 17, in verse 28, by the time. All right, so, so God then organized them before. Now, if he organized them, then it was on the basis of what would be best for each individual. But when we come to mortality, we think otherwise. And a lot of us don't follow the Spirit of the Lord, and our lives get followed up. And so the Prophet Joseph, on that occasion, in his ministry to his Brigham Young, uh, made reference to the fact that, the, that they were all organized to start with, but they are all now in a mother. And the saints need to get the Spirit of the Lord so that they can be guided right. And then the Prophet says, now you teach them to get the Spirit and live by it, and they'll be, and then they'll find themselves as God organized them. And they'll find that their lives then work out in harmony with the foreordained program in respect to them. You see that? All right, now in that sense then, there's a grand organizational council and there's a first organization. And then subject to the agency of people that modified on that, according to me. Be it modified. Uh, it may be, for example, that Thomas B. Mars was called the uh, the person who would lead the saints out to the west. He lived long enough, and he was president of the trial. And had that been the case, had he been faithful, uh, and had uh, sent Carl G. Majors to Provo to organize the uh, BYU, we might have uh, uh, the Thomas B. Marsh University there. He'd say, uh, TVM, la la la. <laughs> you know that. But uh, uh, at least how that all worked out, that's an intricate picture. But at least there's modifications made of necessity. All right, so in the first organization, he says, we were all present, that's all of us. Uh, we weren't present at that grand council on Polar. We were present in the general conference, and then after the war in heaven, then we're all present in this first organization. He says, when we saw the Savior chosen and appointed, and the plan of salvation made, that's where you finally consolidate and say, this is it, and we sanctioned it. You see that? All right, now, in that sense, then, the doctrine of Pauline elections made sure, uh, as it states it here, but the doctrine of the election then begins at this point. And not only was Adam appointed uh, to be uh, the uh, head, but also the prophet Joseph makes this statement, this is the teaching page uh, 365, he says, Every man who has a column to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained to that very purpose in the Grand Council of Heaven before the world was. Now, I don't know how specific that calling was. Uh, in some cases, apparently, it was very specific. In other cases, it may be uh, you are foreordained to hold the holy priesthood of God and to help build the kingdom of God in your day on the earth. And we for we elect you, we call you, and for appoint you to that particular blessing. Uh, and then in respect to what callings you may receive, this this may be a general thing. I don't know that there's that much detail been revealed on the subject. My own personal feeling is that in some instances there is there are specific appointments. In others it may be general in respect to the general uh, uh, 
picture of service and, and opportunity. Now, in that sense, then, when, when people in this grand organizational council appear, just before you get any more colleges, when they're organized, then they receive callings and appointments there that pertain here. In other words, this is the doctrine of election in the flesh. You get your calling and election to certain things that are now going to be realized in mortality. Come. <laughs> well, let me let me take a little different point of view on it, can I? Yeah. I'm not saying that uh, you're wrong or right. I'm just suggesting a different point of view. My understanding of the gospel plan of life is you get shown what you find in it by faith. Some people, for example, the Lord can open to them the knowledge of who they were in previous life, like he did Abraham, and even give them promises as to his children, possibly, how he would relate to it, and it all was contingent upon his faith and righteousness. <clears throat> and other people live along and might live right next door to the temple, and they don't have any kind of faith. And for the Lord just to open up that future to them, which I believe in, is a product of faith. I think the spirit of prophecy is a product of faith. And uh, so my feeling, and the answer I would get to, to the issue of grace, would be this, that for some people, yes, they do, because they paid the price. No. For other people, then, uh, maybe in part. Other people, I don't know. I don't think it's quite that simple that the Lord would say, okay, now here's your life, and let me go to I think there was some general knowledge that was there, but in regard to the specific things, I think these were products of our faith and expressions of the Spirit of prophecy, which came to the hands of only by faith. My uh, own father was a thinker of, and he told me on one occasion that after he had served for a period, that he could, and he laid his hands on people's head to give the things out of blessing. But on certain occasions, he was given a vision of them and three more than him. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of wild they lived there. Now, see, there's a good example of the doctrine of election of the place. Of mm-hmm. course, we're getting the things out of the blessing, the Lord took you back here. The Lord took you back here as a basis for giving uh, the paper of the blessing, which helps lead to making your calling and election sure. And so there's a correlation between prayer and mortality. And that's the thing I want to get over to this evening, is the correlation. Uh, during the teaching of page 189, the prophet gives a great discourse on the doctrine of election. He says this. This is the report of his address. He says, he then spoke on the subject of election and read the ninth chapter of Romans. Now, how many, I don't know how many of you have read the ninth chapter of Romans. That is the classic New Testament statement on the doctrine of election. Verse 4, particularly, is just the very heart of the doctrine of election in the uh, He says, the recognized chapter of Romans, which is evidence, the election they spoken of was pertaining to the flesh. Now, this is not calling election sure. This is election pertaining to the flesh. You see that? Which has its basis back in the earth life. He said, and pertain then, uh, had reference to the seed of Abraham. According to the promises God made to Abraham, saying, In thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. To them, now he's quoting Romans 9 and 4, to them belonged the adoption and the covenants. Now, if you are a descendant of Abraham in the flesh, through Isaac, the chosen seed, Israel, then to you pertains or belongs the adoption and the covenant. Now, what are we talking about? A lot of times when we talk about Abraham, we talk about the Gentiles being adopted into Abraham's family. Now, we're not talking about that. We're talking about blessings that were given to Abraham and to his elect seed in mortality. If they, if the, we are of the blood of Israel, then we have a right to the adoption. Now, the word adoption 
is it came denoting the process of getting into a family into which you were not initially born, okay? And uh, you have to go through legal procedures to, to adopt a child. We had three adopted sons, and each time we uh, uh, got one of the little rascals in the, in the hospital. We then later uh, had to take them uh, down to the court and then that is dangerous, and we got up on the witness stand, and I raised my hand to the square, and, and uh, solemnly swore that I would uh, consider that child as though it had been born into my family, and would accord to it all the rights and privileges that uh, a normal child would have, and when we got through that process, then the judge said, okay, now this child is yours legally as though it had been born into your family. You see that? Uh, now the gospel, then, is based on the doctrine of adoption. The great challenge is to get into the family of Jesus Christ. And if I'm a, I'm a descendant of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob or of Israel, then I have a legal right. That's part of my pre earth election. When I was back here, I was told I would be born in Abraham's family. And that I would, as a result of that, have the legal right to the articles of adoption. And what are the articles of adoption? Faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, laying on of hands, by which you are born again and become sons and daughters of Christ. Okay? All right, now that's part of the doctrine of election, is that some people are, were elected by grace to be born in a lineage where they had a legal right uh, by the Lord's covenant to become his sons and daughters, in which relationship salvation is based. Okay? All right, and not only the adoption, but the covenant. You know, the covenant refers to that higher program that centers in the temple by which the holy order is filled up, which is the order of uh, uh, the Son of God, which Christ belongs to the family. And it's on that basis, then, that salvation and exaltation are given, see? All right, now, back in pre earth life, then, then there were those who, who in that group of our fallen children, were appointed to come here. And that's part of their election in the flesh. And there's responsibilities that go with it also. Come in, please. The ones that they're talking about when it says that they know his voice and know that he's God are the ones that his father has given to him? These are the ones that the father has given. Read Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, where, where uh, uh, Moses makes it clear that there's a house of Israel in pre earth life before there was one on earth. And the indication of that was rather from the doctrine back in the days of Israel. And that the Lord used the house of Israel in pre earth life as the basic uh, rule of thumb in organizing the whole uh, mortal experience that he separated the sons of Adam according to the children of Israel. He used them as a basis, see, and in this whole organizational program by which he was going to send his spirit children to, to the church. Let me go on with the prophet statement. He says, to them belong the adoption and the covenant. He says, the election of the promised seed still continues. And in the last day, Satan has a priesthood restored unto them. All right? That's what patriarchal blessings are about. The major responsibility of patriarchal is to designate leaves. And with leaves comes rights and privileges. Ephraim has certain privileges and rights in the Holy Order, in the, in the house of Israel. That's being organized not just in the flesh now, but in the eternity. All right, so uh, he says, You're looking upon us, you still continue the last days to have the common preacher restored to them, and they shall be saviors upon Mount Zion. Patriarchal blessing can make it and often does make it clear. Uh, mind that, for example, you the blood of the Lord of Israel flows through your hands. Yeah. Indicates also a descendant of the of Ephraim. And I take it that that's not an adopted situation. A patriarch may be inspired to, to uh, uh, make a more specific clarification. Some people, I know no people, for example, I've got friends who uh, uh, are not literally in the blood of Israel, but by adoption are such. Pardon me, it's faithful. It's faithful. Mm-hmm. 
in the order of things, Christ is the head, and then the great patriarchs, and then the holy order, the brethren who hold things of priesthood, become uh, sons of Christ within that order of things. <coughs> and uh, while, for example, in the flesh, my father ought to be the one who teaches me the gospel. And hence then, he would not only be my father in a physical sense, but he would be my father in an eternal life sense. Now, Abraham, if you read Abraham chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, Abraham is told that all those who receive this gospel will be accounted as his seed and would rise up and call him their father. If a Gentile, for example, receives it and is regenerated and born again, they become the sons and daughters of Abraham and are, are adopted into Abraham's family, that is, within Christ's family. It is a double adoption for a Gentile. It is adopted to Christ and then into Abraham. Now, the idea then is that, that uh, your father ought to be your father both physically and spiritually. And that's the whole essence of eternal marriage. If you get the blessings of Abraham, and Abraham's a father two ways instead of one, then he's a father physically, and then he's a father of those who are born again. Truly born again, not the born again that we know about. Him. But uh, uh, then, then he is the father in both ways, is he not? And if you receive the blessings of Abraham in the temple, then the kingdom makes Temple Mary's distinct. <coughs> it gives you the challenge and responsibility of father two ways. Physically, to be getting multiplying kinds of fields, and then the whole thing will home even, to preach the gospel, to become a father under Christ of your family. Now that's the idea. All right, so the prophet goes on and says, the whole of the chapter had reference to the priests in the house of Israel, an unconditional election of individuals to eternal life was not taught by the apostles. Now, when you go back to hear that, in the dark and the flesh, there was no one back there that made his calling less than sure. Why? Because that was not the program. The program is that you take it a step at a time, that you receive a blessing and election here in relation to the flesh, and these are many and varied. Uh, the basis of which are the gospel, the adoption, the covenant of the temple, and so forth. But then you wait until you're over here to have any foundation for common election. Does that also include Christ? Yes, that would include him. On the other hand, the Father's foreknowledge was such that he knew that in sending him to mortality, in a state of forgetfulness, as the rest of us come, that he still had that within him that was necessary to fulfill and carry out his mission. All right, then, he says, God did elect or uh, predestinate that all those who would be saved should be saved in Christ Jesus, and they will be used to the gospel. But he passes over no man's sins that visits them with correction, and the children will not repent of their sins, then he will discard them. All right, so there's, uh, there's, there's this basic idea, then, of uh, election. And uh, it begins here, and it has its fulfillment here, as you come to more chapters. Now, the doctrine of calling lets you make sure, then, let me just say a word or two in general about it. First of all, having received the, the clear callings, that we come to earth in a state of forgetfulness. And so we're, we're left here in a state of forgetfulness. That, that's the test that we're placed under. And uh, it's only when we exert desire and begin to reach that the Lord, even though I'm sure he, uh, uh, in the tenderness of his soul and so forth, is pulling for us and all that, it still has to be on the basis of our agency and our will. Uh, in Alma chapter 13, uh, and this is a classic statement on this in, in the Book of Mormon, as it talks about this aspect of things. See, the whole Book of Mormon is centered in, in the house of Israel back then. And uh, this is the doctrine of election. The covenants then, of, of the Book of Mormon are covenants that God made, not just with Abraham, but previously made clear by here, and then appointed to Abraham. So that he was saying things to Abraham, now those people who were the house of Israel back here, I'm going to make uh, come to mortality through your means. You see that? And then the promises that we gave back here in the Grand Organizational Council are going to be extended and verbalized through you and passed on through you to your posterity. You see that? And that then is the doctrine of election. Now, if they come to mortality, then they come here as a challenge. 
And one challenge is that you're under the power of the fall. Another one is that you come here in a state of forgetfulness. You don't know who you were in previous life or who anyone else was. Right there. Now, as the prophet was, as the prophet Alma then talks about this and about receiving priesthood callings, he says this in verse 3 beginning. And this is the manner after which they were ordained, being called and prepared from the foundation of the world. Now, what does that term foundation of the world mean? What is the foundation of the world? The foundation of my physical body is what? My spirit body, right? That's the foundation of my physical body. Now, the foundation of the world is the spirit world, okay? And if I'm called from the foundation of the world, then that puts it back into your body. He says, uh, according to the foreknowledge of God. All right, now we're called and prepared in the foundation of the world according to the foreknowledge of God. On account of their exceeding faith and good works. Now, in the first place, though, as they found the book of Adam, in the first place, being left to choose good or evil. Therefore, they having chosen good and exercising great faith are called with a holy cause, which was prepared with and according to a preparatory redemption for sex. You get the idea? He says, and thus they have been called with his holy cause. Uh, and he goes on to say, on finding the first place, they are on the same standing with their brethren. That's this holy calling being prepared from the foundation of the world for such as would not harden their hearts. And we come here and uh, we all start essentially at the, at the same level of things. And uh, then as we come here then and respond and reach up, then those three earth appointments begin to be open to us. Now how are they open to us? Well, one way is through the revelation of the gospel and the plan of life and salvation. The third is the free earth life, right? Another way, then, is, as uh, Brother Jordan has indicated here, there is, is a patriarch. Now, a patriarch uh, doesn't tell you everything about your career of life. And the patriarchal blessing is not just an inspired fortune telling program. It's more like what I would call an anchor. You know what an anchor does for a boat? It kind of positions it in a particular place. They see run around, so it positions it. Patriarchal blessing, in some measure, positions you in relation to your life and what the Lord would have you to do. It's not a fortune telling thing. And it's also subject then to conditions. Uh, this program here then is a conditional program. Mm-hmm. Now when you come to earth and then and you find a safe forgetfulness, but you receive the gospel, then this clear election begins to be open to you. And your challenge then is to make your calling and election sure. Now, this program is going to continue that if you come here and get this program and get your life sanctified and founded on the gospel, you can finally get to the point where projecting this program into the resurrection, where the Lord will say, Son or daughter, you have made your calling and election sure in relation to these blessings and their fulfillment in the state of resurrection. Now, that is the doctrine of calling and election sure. It's founded then on the doctrine of election in the place. So we clear on that thing. idea of the gospel. That's the idea of the gospel, that you, that you press forward and make your calling and elect you to it. This is the order of the gospel. The order of the whole priesthood is that we have that right. And uh, uh, in that sense, then, it's, it's part of the natural course of things. Now, let me explain a little further before we draw some conclusions to what I said. Tell me that here first. When you get into the upper programs of Zion, the upper order of the building of the Society of Zion, then it's founded, that upper program is founded on 
having made ten thousand major crime lessons to us. When Zion gets to the point where it's cloud by day and pillar fire by, by night over every one place, which will happen before the second comes, by the way, then it will be on the basis of the sentence in that household that made it all the lessons to us. So it, it, it's more common in the scriptures than we sometimes think. And, and we just need this, if we're teaching the Book of Mormon, we're teaching the scriptures, we need to understand the doctrine. We need to understand it. I'm not trying to say something phenomenal, I'm just trying to talk about the relationship. Here we are in mortality, and uh, what was the program in pre life, and how does it relate here? No. <laughs> Yes, I'll get into that. I don't want some aspects of this I, I don't want to discuss. I just want to talk about the basics of it. And the, there's some safety things that ought to be reserved for, for other places. Uh, that's not that I was cut off and I was calling back, so I'm going to find that in my comment. All right, now, there are two ways in which a person can make his calling election sure. One is to endure faith going to the end of mortality. Now, what's the standard traditional promise for those who endure to the end? They shall have what? Eternal life. All right? If a person receives the gospel and endures faithfully to the end, then what's the result? When you get to the end of mortality and you get into the spirit world, the first thing you ought to do is jump up and down for joy and say, I made it, I have got my calling and election sure to these blessings as they now relate to the, to the resurrection. The resurrection may be a few years down the road for you. But if you receive the gospel and endure faithfully to the end, the standard scriptural promise over and over and over again, you shall have eternal life. Now that's calling and election sure. So you can make it that way. Uh, when I was a Writing this book, Principle Perfection, my wife is teaching the Relief Society in the East Grand States, and uh, she works out some stuff on what it means to endure to the end. I guess maybe both of us worked on it together. We took a concordance, a book of Mormon concordance, uh, Mormon concordance, and we went through uh, and took every word that we elected to endure to the end and studied it, every word. I don't know what it meant. And uh, we came out of there with uh, uh, a real different view on enduring the end than I had before. Uh, enduring the end is a very, very positive thing. You've got to, you've got to be moving fast forward. When you finally get the Lord's <coughs> word to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and they're in. I, I now tell you that you're going to have celestial glory. Uh, this is a very general. Well, making your call that you should, you can take that and move it up here, say that this is death, you can move it up to this point, and have that promise given to you while you still live in the flesh. We get the idea, for example, that salvation is, is a process, and I guess there's processes and aspects to it, but uh, there is such a thing. And, uh, uh, calling election sure then is on uh, that basis. Now, for example, let me turn to Second Peter chapter one, which is one of the classic statements in the New Testament on the doctrine of the gospel, the law of the gospel, with the great objective of making our calling and election sure. This is one that President McCabe used to to uh, talk about all the time, uh, where. Uh, Peter, for example, says this, uh, verse 5, Besides all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and a virtue knowledge. Now, this is not to keep a guy busy all day and night. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. Wow. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And above other time this charity, he says, uh, For if these things be in you and abound, if you build on this foundation, and these things abound in you, he says, They make you that you shall neither be fair nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, then he goes on and says, 
Wherefore, would you rather then, verse 10, give diligence to make your calling and election sure? For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministering to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the, the, the gate is straight, and the way is narrow that leads there. But when you've got through the gate, and your car election is sure, then there is an abundance of blessings and of manifestations of the spirits that are given. And uh, he goes on, for example, uh, citing his own experience as a basis, as a basis of what he is teaching. He had walked with the Savior, had been with him, and uh, had uh, seen Christ's miracles. Uh, one of the highlights of their experience in that ministry was the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John were there when uh, the keys of the Holy Order were committed, and uh, Christ was transfigured. The prophet Joseph indicates the three apostles also were. They received their temple ordinances there, and so forth. Uh, now, Peter, referring to that experience, says, For we had not followed cunningly divine fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He's referring now to the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, In this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now, having said that, and borne testimony to those great and glorious things, then he says, We have also, now here's something else that they've got, in addition to this, that he just mentioned, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. And we'll get to that and what it means. Wherein ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rises in your heart. All right, we have, they not only had those experiences, but he says, we also then have a more sure word. Now, the prophet Joseph Smith gave two great discourses on this. One begins about page 298, and the other about page 305 in the teaching. And uh, he, just in capsule form, at least the report then, indicates that uh, uh, this great secret then within inspired understanding within the writings of Peter on this particular subject. He says, now there, some, there is some grand secret here, and the key to unlock the subject. Notwithstanding the apostle exhorts them to add to their faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, etc., yet he exhorts them to make their calling and election sure. And though they had heard an audible voice from heaven bearing testimony that Jesus was the Son of God, Yet, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, wherein do you do well that you may take heed as a light in the dark place. He says, now we're uh, in, should there be a more sure word of prophecy than, than uh, to hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son. What's more, what's more sure than that? See? He says, now the man's secret. He says, though they might have heard the voice of God and known that Jesus was the Son of God, this would be no evidence that their calling, that their election and calling was made sure. That they had part with Christ uh, and were joint heirs with him. They would then want that more sure word of prophecy that they were sealed in the heavens and had the promise of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Then having this promise sealed to them, it was an anchor to their soul. Sure and steadfast. Uh, though the thunders might roll, the lightning flash, the earthquakes bellow and war began to sit around, yet this hope and knowledge would support the soul in every hour. Then knowledge, through our Lord Jesus Christ, is the name to Now, in this later discourse on it, beginning in verse, uh, uh, page, rather, uh, uh, 305, he says this. Uh, he says there are three things in this discourse. One, he says knowledge is the power of salvation. That's not Ph.D. knowledge. I got one of those in the too, and that kind of stuff won't work. Uh, it's great to have, and it opens a lot of doors and, and so forth, but the knowledge he's talking about here is the knowledge that comes in the gospel when you learn uh, its doctrine, and particularly when you learn how to be taught by the Spirit of God, so that the living revelation of the Spirit is a part of your life and spirit. The knowledge that's conveyed to you in that way. Now, secondly, 
uh, making a calling next to store. The third point, it's one thing to be on the mount, like Peter, James, and John, and hear the excellent voice. And another thing, to hear that voice declared to you personally, you have a part and a lot in that kingdom. You see that? It's one thing to have a marvelous experience like Peter, James, and John had, and it's another thing to have that voice say to them, in the resurrection, you're going to be with Christ in his kingdom. All right, now in that sense, then, there's the guarantee. Now, the prophet talks about a more sure word, and uh, uh, in one of the revelations, we have an explanation of this, and in the early editions of this revelation, it refers to the use that Peter made of the term, uh, makes it clear that it's a clarification of Second Peter chapter 1. I have reference to uh, section 131 of the document itself. For in verse 5, we have this statement. The more sure word of prophecy here in the Revelation than it used to be as spoken of by Peter. And, but the more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up into eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's see if we can explain that. Back here in Peter's life, in the Grand Organizational Council, when we were given promises or appointments, those promises and appointments were given by the Spirit of prophecy. What do you Those who had the keys made the appointments given by the Spirit of prophecy. Now that prophetic word that was given back to you to be realized in mortality in its realization was contingent. As we read from the prophet, the unconditional election was not taught by the apostles, and you don't make the calling election sure that that's it. This prophetic word is a contingent word. Otherwise, it's unfolded in that we're born here, and then whether we even receive the gospel depends on what. Whether we have the faith to listen to the missionaries, right? Or whether we have the faith to go on and get our temple endowment. Or whether we have the faith to go on and get married in the temple. You see that? And so that, that promise then of adoption and of the higher covenant is a contingent promise. It's not a sure promise. Now when you come to those here in mortality, you know, and if you meet that challenge of overcoming the powers of the world, uh, receiving the gospel, getting a testimony, growing and developing in it, and when you add to your faith virtue, the virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, the temperance patience, the patience godliness, brotherly kindness, etc., etc., when you do that, and thereby make your calling and election sure, then there is a prophetic word given, we have to explain this whole thing, that is a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than that. That is more sure than the faith word. And as the prophet said, it's more sure than being on the line of transfiguration and hearing the voice of God say to the, about the Son, this is my beloved Son. I mean, it's more sure than that, too. It's more sure than in this code here, and it's more sure than any kind of witness that you might receive about the other person. You see that? It's more sure than anything that you might receive about the other person. It's something now that relates to you by which you personally can enjoy. Uh, the blessing that you are concerned with. Um, here's how the prophet explains it. He's in page 324. He says, reading the experience of others or the revelation given to them can never give us a comprehensive view of our condition and true relation to God. You can read about Abraham all day long and you can glory in what God gave to him and you can know that God is no respecter of persons, but until you get that kind of faith that brings the Lord's revelation into your life, and he says a few things to you personally, then you're merely reading like someone else. Now he says, a knowledge of these things can only be obtained by experience through the ordinances of God. When you begin with the gospel, by laying on of hands with the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it becomes a channel of revelation to you, then you can begin to learn these things about your own life. He says, uh, uh, I assure the saints that truth in reference to these matters can and may be known through the revelations of God 
in the way of his ordinances and in answer to prayer. And he gives us an example of a Hebrew church. They came up uh, and received these blessings. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Kind of right now. Uh, <coughs> every one that is placed on this earth, are they given an election calling and his business? Well, or does it just come through the seed of Abraham? No, in the broad sense, for example, when the Lord appointed people to come to mortality, then there's a, there's a general election to all people. For example, in the Book of Mormon, we have a reference to a great Gentile nation on this land. No, it was previously appointed. They were called. They were elected. And there were certain promises that were given to the Gentiles as a nation, and as a people, are they not? Now, those on elections, uh, they opened the way for the gospel, but uh, in the, in the broad doctrine of calling an election, calling an election refers then to the appointments made in the of life that you realize in mortality. Now that differs from foreordination. Foreordination is a more restricted part of that overall picture and it relates to priesthood. You're foreordained to receive priesthood, you see. You're not foreordained to come in the human nation. That's not an ordination. You're not foreordained to be a, among the Gentiles. You're foreordained to hold priesthood. And so in the total broad doctrine of election in the flesh, part of it then, a narrow part of it, that is a specific thing, is the doctrine of foreordination of individuals to priesthood or specific cause to be there. And, uh, but uh, the broader picture then does include the whole, the whole thing of, of Adam. All right, now in that case then, uh, this brings us then to what we call the, the uh, doctrine of the second comfort here. Here in the teaching, page 149 through about 151, is one of the great discourses of this dispensation on the gospel. I wish we had a total uh, uh, report of it. We just had a, a brief synopsis of it. But uh, the prophet starts out uh, from faith and takes the whole program of the gospel of the calling election. And in the course of the talk, he says this. There are two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy Ghost, the thing that's given on the day of Pentecost, and that all saints receive after faith, repentance, and baptism. This first comforter, or Holy Ghost, has no other effect than pure intelligence that is more powerful in expanding the mind, enlightening the understanding, storing the intellect with present knowledge of a man who is the little seed of Abraham and one of who is a Gentile. Though it may not have half as much visible effect upon the body, for as the Holy Ghost falls upon the little seed of Abraham is as calm and free and his whole soul and body are only exercised by the pure spirit of intelligence. Now the effect of the Holy Ghost upon the Gentile is to purge out the old blood. And once you get a you get some actual transformation physically. Now he says, now the other temperature is spoken of is a subject of great interest and perhaps understood by few in this generation. After a person has faith in Christ, Repent of his sins and is baptized for the remission of his sins and receives the Holy Ghost by the hand of hand, which is the first comforter. Then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Not just living like a baby, but in the gospel, in the glory of our conscience. Hungering and thirsting uh, after righteousness and living by every word that proceeds from not God. And the Lord will soon say to him, not in your 80th birthday or afterwards, but the Lord will soon say to him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. And when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and found that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other company, which the Lord has promised to the saints as is recorded in the testimony of John, John chapter 14. And now he says, now what is this other temperature? He says, it's nothing more nor less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is the sum and substance of the whole matter. So when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him, or appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him, and the visions of heaven will be open to him, and the Lord will teach him face to face, and he will have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God, and this, he says, is the state and place the ancient saints arrived at when they had just glorious visions. Isaiah, 
Ezekiel, John upon the Isle of Patmos, St. Paul in the three heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the general assembly of Jesus the firstborn. Well, now, let me get a little more specific on that. Uh, in this program, then, of second comfort, there's two expressions, then, of the second comfort. One is what has been called the second comfort of promise. And the other is called the second comfort of heaven. Now, what is the second comfort of promise is the guarantee. The official statement, finally exalted, God is our shall be exalted. Uh, and wouldn't that be a comfort? See, that is the second comfort of, of, of promise. The example of that scripturally is section 88 of the Doctrine of Covenant. Section 88, uh, Revelation gives some of the early brethren, the Lord begins on, on that plane. He says, for example, there is thus saith the Lord, and you have assembled yourselves together, you see his will concerning you. Behold, this is pleasing of the Lord. The prayers are come to the Lord of the Lord, and are recorded in the book of the name of the saints of power. He says, Wherefore, I now send upon you another comfort, <coughs> even upon you, my friends, that it may abide in your heart. Now, uh, this isn't seeing the Lord. This is a comfort, though, that's going to abide in your heart. He says that uh, even the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the Holy Spirit of promise is the Holy Ghost functioning to ratify ordinances and declarations. And when the Lord says, to your time thou shalt be exalted, and the Holy Spirit ratifies that, then by its power it dwells in your heart. Right? It's the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, he ratifies eternal marriage and a lot of other things, too. He says that uh, even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comfort is, it's the same that I promised you, my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. This comforter is the promise which I've given to you of eternal life, even the glory of the celestial kingdom. Uh, one occasion, Hyman Smith gave a blessing to Peter C. Kimball's uh, wife, the late, one of the most faithful women in the early days of the church. Uh, this is the novel period of time. Uh, the blessings recorded in uh, uh, the life of David W. Kimball, page 127. Beloved sister, I lay my hands upon your head in the name of Jesus, and feel of you unto eternal life. I just stop on that. And then gave blessings. Sealed here on earth and sealed in heaven, and your name written in the land book of life never to be blotted out. The thing is mentioned and manifest. Just to comfort your heart and to be a comfort unto you henceforth all your days. Do not live with it, will you? in addition to the Holy Ghost. He says that if even a promise according to the mind of the Spirit, and the Spirit shall bear record of the truth. The same, and note this now, the same is called the second comforter, not his presence, but his promise. All right, now what's the second comforter's promise? It's what the late Kimball Spirit says, right? Uh, when a person has received that, then what are the privileges? Then the privileges <coughs> are the blessing of the second comfort of presence. Okay? And uh, uh, let me put it this way. In a matter of thinking, there are two churches, two churches that live the same. One is the outer church, and we call it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And uh, you get into this church by what means? Baptism, the articles of the doctrine. Right? And what is the basic <coughs> instructional medium that you had access to within the Church of Jesus Christ, other than the living oracle? All right, the Holy Ghost or the first one. <coughs> <right? coughs> uh, now, when a person makes the calling of the cure, they enter into a more restricted church. What's the name of this church? The Church of the Firstborn. And uh, how do you get into this church? You get into it through the healing organs, through making your calling and the election sure. That's how you get into it. Uh, what then is the basic 
blessing, the higher blessing that's open to you. Over here, the first couple here is open to you. Let's say, what's the blessing here? The second comes with the upset, right? Now, what does that entail? What does that entail? In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about this. Uh, now, the scriptures are full of this, of this doctrine, and, and uh, Hebrews uh, 12 is one of the great statements. The prophet quoted it, the prophet built it, it, quoted it over and over again. Beginning with verse uh, uh, 22, he says this, But here come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God. Now, Mount Zion on earth is merely a, uh, an approximation of something way up there. If you were to take a field trip to the celestial kingdom and look around and ask who belongs where and who lives where, you'd find that God lives in Mount Zion and it's also called the heavenly Jerusalem. And then the idea is, through Revelation, to reveal that order and program of human regeneration, spiritual truth and life and power to the people on this earth and build an order of things on this earth that, that kind of duplicate. So you build Mount Zion and and grace them on earth to where they finally come up and they connect together and the millennial assembly, the church of firstborn comes down in the millennial period, and they have a union between the two, see? But the original one then is up there. Now Paul speaking then to the Hebrews says, ye are come unto Mount Zion. It, they've been there, they've made it. It's like they have it as a veil, a little of the second country. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, now, what's the general assembly in search of the firstborn? Well, there's a general assembly on this earth. It's the highest priesthood body on this earth. Supersedes the first presidency in the form of the twelve. Read about it in section 107. It's a council of, it's a body of the priesthood organizing general assembly. And hearing then a particular case, and the Lord tells us in section 107, that in case of need, you could present a case to the general assembly with countermand the decisions of any other presiding forms in the first presidency. This is the ultimate priesthood body within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The general assembly is the ultimate priesthood body. Okay? Now there is a general assembly pertaining to the Church of the Firstborn. And it consists then of the priesthood of that higher order of okay. things. Okay? And no person may be calling that sincere then, then he says that. Uh, uh, they come down to the heavenly Jerusalem, he says, to the numeral company of angels, you have angelic ministry, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. I like quickly, we've got to wind back to uh, before too long. Uh, the blessings then that are open to the individual are the blessings of instruction from the higher sources of celestial life and glory. Here in the teachings, page 320, the prophet puts it this way. As he uh, uh, talks about the seven years of what would it profit us to come unto the spirit of just men, but to learn and come to the standard of their knowledge? Now, once you learn what's in the scriptures, then there's nothing more that you can get. That's what it's saying. All right, now the blessings then also relate to people who make the calling like these schools and uh, by enduring faithfully to the end. For example, what happens to a righteous person at death? Where do they go? Well, we say they go to paradise, right? And that's fine. But uh, what is the state and condition to which they go? You read the uh, section 129 carefully, and when that reads carefully, it's just bad. You find that they go to a state of celestial glory. The prophet says this, there are two kinds of beings in heaven, two kinds, angels who are resurrected and invite Christ in the resurrection as being such a person. And the second kind, he says, who dwell in heaven, the spirit of just men made perfect, they who are not resurrected but inherit the same glory. Now when a person makes his calling like he's sure, and your faith in the end, they die, they go to the spirit world. But they go to celestial glory in the spirit world, okay? And they enjoy the visions and the revelation and the power then of celestial life as disembodied spirits. Here in the teachings, for example, page 
page 25 and 6. The prophet is talking of the funeral sermon of Judge Adams, uh, James Adams, who was a patriarch and uh, a man of importance in the prophet's life in more than one way. And he says this, Spirits come over to the field and find glory. Angels have advanced further, they're like the glory of being happy. The spirits of just men are made ministering servants to those who are sealed into eternal life. And it's through them that the feeding power is sent down. And he goes on, he says that, Let um, Brother Adams has not opened more effectual door to the bed. The spirits of the just are exalted to a greater and more glorious work. And hence they are blessed in the departure of the world of spirit. Enveloped in flaming fire, they are not far from it. And no one understands our thoughts and our feelings, uh, and most things are often pained their way. Now, a person who's righteous then, who hits the spirit well, they're given the blessings of the second country. They're in the presence of God. They're in power and glory. They're enveloped in celestial glory and power. Right? And in that sense, then, the blessings are there. Now, I just want to keep clarification. There is such a thing, then, uh, as receiving a guarantee if you're calling what you make sure. That has an exception to it. There is what the prophet Joseph Smith called a reserve to the reading power. Some speaking faith speaker in the national media. Uh, and that is that the receiving power of the priesthood cannot seal you again the unpardonable sin. Now when a person has made his or her calling what you make sure, then you have a guarantee. Provided they do not become predictable. Okay, that was very specific. All right, but if they sin willfully, uh, after they have received that blessing, then what's their situation? I'm talking about the distinction between inadvertent sin and willful premeditated sin. Uh, and the point is simply this, that for willful premeditated sin, when a person is in that particular state, then the opponent of Christ will not pay the debt. And the Prophet Joseph has organized the school of the prophets. He organized on the plan the calling that he made sure. He sealed them all up to eternal life. That's back in 1833. And then he sat down and talked to them. He says this, uh, I then said to the elders, uh, as I have done so you can do you, uh, walk one on his feet. That's an ordinance relate to this level of sin. He says, by the power of the Holy Spirit tonight, come out from all sins and the blood of this generation. But if any of them should sin willfully, after they were thus cleansed and sealed up unto eternal life, they should be given over to the buffetings of Satan until the day of redemption. In other words, Christ will not pay the debt for willful sin, for the individual has attained to that state of knowledge, and uh, where it's premeditated, and where the uh, uh, light and glory and truth has been given. So the individual then would have to pay the debt themselves. Now, this is a statement in section 132 that everyone quotes, and in my experience over the years, I've known of people who have even gone so far as to say that because they've been married in the temple, they're trying to, and they can go out and be unfaithful to their wives and do a lot of other things, and, and they're going to make it in the final analysis. I'm referring to verse 26, where the, uh, the Lord makes this explanation. He said, Verily I say unto you, if a man marry a wife according to my word, and they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, according to my appointment. And he or she shall commit any sin or transgression of the new and everlasting covenant, whatever. That gives a pretty broad latitude. And all manner of blasphemy. And if they commit no murder, wherein they promise, wherein they said it is blood, that will make them tradition. Yet they shall come forth in the first resurrection and enter into their exaltation. On what condition? that they would pay the debt of will for sin themselves. And so he goes on and says, uh, But they shall be destroyed in the blood, and shall be delivered into the blood of the faith and his law. That has no reference to a person who's made in the temple. When a person is made the common way to destroy them, they will be given blood. The, uh, the blessings then of feeling from a is to not only receive the gospel and as individuals and its fulfillment, then the whole Latter-day program of Christ's second coming is him. Note how the prophet put it here in the teaching 340. He's talking about the, the program of building the holy order, and uh, he says that the spirit of Elias is first. Now that's the missionary spirit. It gets you into the church. 
Elijah second and Messiah last. That's the order of building. He says, Elias is the foreman, to prepare the way, and the spirit and power of Elijah is to come after, holding the keys of power, building the temple, not just the physical structure, but the holy order, which is built up in it, building the temple to the capstone, not turning the capstone on, but building this order up to the capstone, placing the seals of the Melchizedek priesthood upon the house of Israel. Okay, now that says a lot that we don't want to talk about here, uh, the things that take this place. Uh, facing the seals of the Melchizedek priest upon the house of Israel and making all things ready. Then Messiah comes to his temple, and this is Malachi 3, where Christ will come suddenly to his temple. Then Messiah comes to his temple, which is last of all. And he puts the capstone on. You see that? He puts that capstone on. But before he does that, then the saints have not only entered the church, uh, not only been married to the temple, but they have had the seals of the Holy Priesthood. And then when Christ comes, then he puts the capstone on, makes them in actual fact, kings and priests and queens and priests. And on the basis then of that higher preparation, the millennial kingdom will finally be established, and Christ will come and will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And this then is preparatory to the millennial program. Now, what does that say about the need to know the doctrines of the kingdom? What does it say about the need to add to our faith virtue, the virtue knowledge, and to be sanctified? <clears throat> and have the Lord in his way, in his own time, then give to us those blessings and finally bring us up to that level of spiritual excellence where we can finally consummate that program and we can come to the temple and place the top stone on that sacred and holy order. Now can you see the need, brothers and sisters, to teach the gospel, to understand it, to apply it, and to get ourselves sanctified as a faith, and become a dying people in this faith. We've got much to do and a long way to go, but it's all part of the great preparatory work for the second coming of the Lord. I want to bury my testimony with the two doctrines. I hate to see it uh, phenomenalized, rather than put it that way. It's just the part of this flow of things from pre life here, fear, and then the challenge now, to live faithfully, and to get the love of God in our lives, and uh, to get the Spirit of the Lord in our lives, and to have that Spirit in our lives in the sense that we get regenerated, and we just can't get home and not get the home teaching and visiting teaching done, and can't get our tithing paid. And we need to challenge this personal discipline to clean up our thinking and our lives and our language. And to have that kind of love and purity in our relationship with each other we need. So that under those circumstances, and those are the only circumstances I know of, where the Lord then will say, Son or daughter, thou shalt be exalted. May the Lord bless us, brothers and sisters, to see this and to do it in the fire. And I bear you my witness that it's true, it's the true doctrine, the brother and the product of all through the dispensation, and you need to see it reverently and sacredly, and I'm constantly you do that. But nevertheless, it means properly to be understood, and we need to know that it's a goal to the truth. Lord bless you, I pray humbly to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much for that.